It's February 15, 1996 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. We're in the province of Sichuan in China, in a remote and mountainous area where the Chinese had established a launch site for geostationary satellites. It's a bit before 3 a.m. and the engineers in the Mission Command and Control Center are monitoring the parameters of the rocket before the final countdown. While all of this looks routine, you can already notice a couple of details that tell you that this launch is not ordinary. The rocket was the Long March 3B, China's heaviest launch vehicle at the time, and this was its very first launch. But more intriguing for a contemporary viewer is the fairing, on which you can see the logo of a large American multinational, the satellite operator Intelsat. Inside this fairing is Intelsat 708, a state-of-the-art telecommunication satellite manufactured by US-based company Space Systems Lore. The engineers in the control center held their breath. The made launch of a new rocket is always a stressful moment. These risks are generally mitigated by using a dummy payload instead of a real satellite from a paying customer. However, this was not the case here. There was a valuable American satellite, and the launch was being broadcast live to the United States. The engineers knew this was a risky operation, but they didn't know that the disaster that would soon occur was about to change the course of China's space program and its relations with the US forever. We're in the 1990s, a period of warming relations between China and the US, starting back in the 1970s and which continued through the 1980s. China had led until then a mostly inward-facing space program, but this was changing. The Chinese were now beginning to expand internationally, proposing their rockets to foreign countries and grabbing a slice of the global launch market, which was until then shared between American, European, and Russian rockets. Unsurprisingly, the US government was displeased with the arrival of the Chinese in the international launch market, suspecting their prices of undercutting the market. But they eventually agreed to a system of quotas, granting permission for US satellites to be launched from China on board Chinese rockets. And this led to a major shift in the launch market. Starting in the early 1990s, you suddenly had Australia launching telecommunication satellites on Long March rockets. They were joined by the Swedish and the Filipino, as well as Hong Kong, still under British rule at the time. And even American firms would join the trend with satellite operators like Iridium, Ecosat, and you guessed it, Intelsat, the owner of Intelsat 708. So back to February 15, 1996. It's 3 a.m. We are moments away from the disaster. On the Xichang launch pad number two, the Long March 3B was fully fueled, containing nearly 400 tons of UDMH and nitrogen tetroxide, a propellant combo that's highly toxic if inhaled by humans. In 1996, this was one of the world's most powerful rockets, capable of putting 5.1 tons into GTO. Finally, the umbilical swing arms were eventually disconnected, and the launch reached the final countdown. And what follows next is one of the most spectacular accidents in spaceflight history. Now let's explain what just happened. When a Long March 3B lifts off the pad, it is supposed to climb vertically for 10 seconds to gain altitude, after which it begins inclining its trajectory, a necessary maneuver to insert a satellite into orbit. But on February 15, 1996, the Long March 3B instead veered off its initial course just two seconds after liftoff, rapidly adopting a horizontal trajectory and acting more as a cruise missile rather than a launch vehicle. That night, the rocket was supposed to launch towards the east with an azimuth of 97.5 degrees, but instead it adopted a more southward trajectory, smashing into a nearby hill situated 1.85 kilometers southeast and generating an explosion equivalent to 20 to 55 tons of TNT. Investigations later determined that it was a defect with a bonding within the inertial system that led the rocket to deviate from its trajectory. The consequences were absolutely disastrous. 
First of all, from a human standpoint, the crash site was next to a residential area destined to employees of the launch center. Close by was also farmland, as well as the village of Maya Lin, just situated a kilometer to the south. The official figures came two weeks later, with the People's Daily reporting six dead and 57 wounded. Now, this is a bit of a debated number today, with some dissonant voices, notably in Western media, having pointed at the scenes of utter destruction that were caught on film, and also the fact that the foreigners present on site were prohibited from approaching the crash site in the immediate aftermath of the accident. According to some testimonies brought back by American engineers, the military were suspected of cleaning up the crash site. But from all the other testimonies I've read and viewed, overall it seems that the death toll was rather limited due to two factors. Firstly, surrounding areas of the launch site were evacuated before the event, and this is something that you'd expect for any launch. This included the employees' residential buildings and reportedly the Myelin village. Also, the explosion happened at 3 a.m. in the morning, ruling out the possibility that farmers were out in the field working their land. A piece written by the Chinese space analyst Chen Lan also points to an interesting fact. The demographic data of the villages show growth in the past two decades, and you can sort of see this on satellite imagery. Something like that would likely be impossible if the village had been completely wiped out by the explosion. Now, beyond the damage and the life loss, the Intelsat 708 launch failure was triggering another set of events, this time on the other side of the Pacific. Suspicions were rising amongst US lawmakers that the Chinese military was benefiting from technology transfer coming from collaborations with Western companies, as well as from technology theft. The failed Intelsat 708 launch was front and center in these suspicions. Certain Congress people considered as evidence the fact that the crash site was sealed off from American engineers in the immediate aftermath of the disaster, giving the opportunity for the Chinese military to collect the most sensitive components from the satellite debris. In June 1998, the US House of Representatives set up a special commission to investigate the transfer of space tech to China, headed by this guy, Republican Congressperson Christopher Cox. The result of this commission was this, the US national security, military, and commercial concerns with the People's Republic of China. Completed in early 1999, it was also colloquially known as the Cox Report. This was a massive document with over 900 pages, 11 chapters, and basically it accused the Chinese of acquiring US technology through lawful means like purchases and collaborations, but also in more malicious ways through theft and deception. These accusations went way beyond the satellite industry and included nuclear weapons, high-performance computers, missile technology, jet engines, and advanced manufacturing. Western satellite firms, and notably Hughes and Space Systems Laurel, were accused of being lax on security and going beyond the terms of their export licenses. The Cox Report led to the US dealing arguably the single and most powerful blow to the Chinese space industry. U.S. satellites were added to the United States munitions list, defining them as weapons of war. This meant that any export of U.S. satellites or satellite subsystems now required the green light of the Department of State, which was, in practice, a ban on all U.S. satellite exports to China. The consequences were instantaneous. The number of Chinese rockets launching foreign satellites nosedived, going from an all-time high in 1998 to literally zero overnight. This was a blow to China, especially since foreign satellites had come to represent more than half of all of Chinese launches in the 1990s. But it's worth noting that Chinese domestic payload launches quickly ramped up in the 2000s, so in the end, this was not the biggest hit. No, the most significant impact of all this, the Intelsat 708 disaster, the Cox report, and the subsequent trade restrictions, is the decoupling of the Chinese space sector from the rest of the world. Today, if you're a satellite operator shopping for a satellite, you can go for an American-made satellite bus, get the instruments from Israel, get telemetry from a European company, and you could get launch from, say, an Indian launch vehicle. Anything is basically possible. But U.S. trade restrictions have made it very difficult for Chinese companies to enter this kind of collaboration, especially if a Chinese-based launch is involved. 
To give you an example, in September 2022, China and the UAE signed an agreement to have the UAE made Rashid II lunar rover fly on board the Chang'e 7 mission scheduled in 2026. This agreement fell apart in March 2023 due to US export restrictions on China. As a result, Chinese space companies today tend to propose a full package. So you're getting a satellite belt by CAS, but also launch services that are proposed by China Great Wall on a CALT or SAS developed Long March rocket. And insurance is proposed by one of China's big insurance companies. And this is quite unique to space when you think of it, because in contrast, if you take the aerospace industry, for example, you'll find Western made systems powering China's latest commercial aircraft, the Comac C919. And similarly, you'll have Chinese companies providing parts for Airbus and Boeing commercial aircraft. Now, I'm still trying to figure out how this isolated situation of Chinese space will evolve in the future. I mean, on one hand, things are just not getting better with the US. Over the past decade, things have escalated with new laws like the Wolf Amendment, which prevents any direct unauthorized contact between NASA and Chinese counterparts. Or just look at how NASA Administrator Bill Nelson describes China's space program. The Chinese uh, space program is also a military space program. China has not been forthcoming. They could go to the South Pole of the Moon where the resources are, and they could land and they would say, this is our exclusive territory, you stay out. And on the other side, China itself has also started building up its own legal arsenal to impose sanctions and export restrictions, and recently applying them to companies like Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman. But if there's one thing that's changed compared to the past, it's the fact that China is now a full-fledged space power with a space station in low Earth orbit, multiple missions scheduled for the moon, sample return missions to Mars and on asteroids, and a plan to land humans and establish a base on the moon. More and more, this is becoming a convincing alternative to third countries who want to be involved in space. And I'm saying this beyond the usual suspects like Venezuela, Pakistan, North Korea, or Iran. We're seeing countries like Saudi Arabia, Brazil, the UAE, and South Africa interested in engaging with China's space program. It doesn't mean that these countries are joining a pro-China camp or anything, but rather that they want to be playing both sides. So it's possible that the US will find it more and more difficult to enforce this blockade against Chinese space. Within Europe, and even perhaps a minority in the US, there are also those who advocate cooperation with China, especially in the domain of space sciences and space exploration, where national security risks seem more limited. Europe has been doing this quite a bit in the past, with many Sino-European missions, and there are, for example, several European payloads to fly on board the upcoming Chang'e 6 lunar mission. And I think there's also this tacit understanding that we're still in the early stages of the establishment of a human presence in space, and it would be in the interest of all to not have geopolitics on Earth spill over the Earth's orbit or to the lunar surface. Anyway, I'm really curious to know what you think about this whole Intelsat 708 story, as well as how you see collaboration between China and other countries in the future. Let me know in the comment section below. As always, I want to say a big thank you to all of my patrons on Patreon.com and YouTube memberships for supporting the channel. If you found value in this content, please consider supporting our channel in our journey to cover Chinese space. Thank you for watching.